Good day to you. Jim Evans of Honest Jim's Wandering Shop here. And today I want to start the first of a series of little documentaries about pirates. Today I want to start off by first introducing at, uh, where pirates come from at, uh, and how you get to be a pirate. So it starts off with sailors. Now, to be a sailor would normally be a kind of career you'd be drawn to if you were already living in a coastal area. So if you're living in a big port area, at, uh, or you, even a, a small fishing village, likelihood is that at, uh, that's the kind of work you'd end up doing. Uh, often this would mean that your father was a sailor before you, and generally you'd start out at uh, about the age of eight or so at uh, working fishing boats and local shipping. So you wouldn't be gone from your local area for more than a few days at most at the time, at, uh, but during this time you'd be learning all the sailor skills, learning how to handle the rigging, how to sail, how to maintain vessels, and all the work that's required to be a sailor. Uh, a lot of people seem to think that sailors actually earned less than other labourers. Comparatively speaking, sailors actually uh, uh, had, were quite well paid compared to other labourers, uh, but it did depend on your level of skill. Obviously, a young boy will be paid less than a grown man, uh, uh, and a landsman, somebody that was a, a, kind of a farm labourer, for example, taking a ship, will be paid a lot less than an able uh, seaman. Uh, so I do use the word man. Uh, nearly all sailors were men. We know of some exceptions to them all, but we're going to focus on the majority, which is a vast majority in this case. So historically speaking, most sailors would have been men. Uh, so, and we're, when we're talking about pirates and sailors in this case, we're talking about the golden age of piracy, which is generally agreed to be about 1680 through to 1730s, at, uh, well, end of the 1720s, really. So, as a young lad, you'd have been learning the skills required. You'd have had some education. At, uh, literacy rates uh, we are generally thought to have been around 60% uh, amongst sailors. That is, the ability to, to write your own name and be able to read a few pages from the Bible. And these improve as, as pit time goes on. People wanted to be able to read it, at, uh, and to a lesser extent to write, but mostly to read. The 18th century world was a world of paper. At, uh, every contract for a job, all the agreements as to how much you're going to be paid, the work you're going to do, would be in the paperwork. If you couldn't read, you're at a significant disadvantage to other people. So, you've learnt the skills, you've learnt your trade at, uh, as a young lad. And when did they get to about sort of 12, 13 or 14? At uh, this point, uh, the desire to go and travel further abroad tends to come along. The idea of going for a bit more of an adventure. And of course you've got lots of merchant vessels sailing all over the world. The typical route at this time, if you're sailing from England, would be from merchant ship to head south down towards Africa. At, uh, at this point in time, merchant ships would take gold and silver for payment, along with various trinkets, and would be trading off the coast of Africa. There's only one or two actual harbours on the coast of Africa in these areas, and both of these are quite small. At, uh, so most ships would actually have to anchor offshore, at, uh, and the cargo they'd be collecting here would be slaves. At, uh, so black Africans who would be captured by other African tribes along the coast uh, so they go out and send uh, parties inland to capture people from other tribes and bring them to the coast that, uh, where they'd be sold as slaves to uh, the uh, to European merchant ships. At, uh, and the merchant ships would be, as I say, anchored offshore, which would also make them quite an easy target for pirates, which we'll get to a bit later on. Once a cargo had been loaded at, uh, of slaves, the ships would then be sailing to the Americas at uh, uh, during this period of time, the crew of the European ships would often uh, st start to come, uh, be suffering from diseases such as malaria because mosquitoes could fly that far out to get to the ships. And in particular, inexperienced sailors who hadn't been to Africa before were more vulnerable to this disease. One effect this causes is that the Africans who are selling slaves know that the Europeans want to leave. And they want to load up the slaves as quickly as they can and sail away. So if they can delay the delivery of the slaves, then the Europeans will pay more money because they're worried about losing their crew. So this was quite a common stalling tactic used to try and bring the price of the slaves up. When the cargo of slaves has been loaded, the ships will then be sailing across towards the Caribbean. The reason for that is there is a current at, uh, uh, across the Atlantic, which means that sailing 
at uh, south, at, uh, in a clockwise direction, is the way forward. At, uh, uh, so they're going to go at, uh, southwards from Africa uh, and across towards the Caribbean. At, uh, the Caribbean is of course a particularly dangerous area, you've got shallow reefs and it's prone to also tropical storms as well. At, uh, and also it tended to be a pirate stronghold at, for quite a large part of this period. At, uh, due to a at, uh, less than satisfactory naval presence in the area. And so, the, again, the, naval, the merchant ships here are at risk of being attacked by pirates, at, uh, who would not only take any gold or silver on board, but quite often they'd actually take the slaves, which they themselves could sell. At, uh, however, if your merchant ship makes it uh, through there, you'd then proceed north along the at, uh, American coast, and along here, at say, uh, the various ports you can put in to sell the cargo of slaves, and at this point you would be loading up cargoes to take back to Europe. Uh, rum, sugar, tobacco, uh, rice, uh, cotton, lots of crops, lots of materials, raw resources to take from the New World back across the ocean to England. Uh, so along the way, merchant ships might stop off at Greenland. They still follow that current, so they have to go north at, uh, and, at, uh, and then cross the Atlantic that way. Off Greenland there is a very large fishery, uh, as well as actually just fishing vessels. You've got whaling ships as well, and uh, so things like whale oil can be purchased there as well. Uh, so pirates uh, didn't tend to raid this area so much, but if they did, they would find lots of willing volunteers to join their crews, because if you are a sailor trapped in Green uh, Greenland, when I say trapped, it would be trapped by the fact that the cost of food and materials is much greater there, Often the sailors would find themselves in debt and end up having to continuously work there, unable to escape. This makes them all willing to join up and become pirates. Eventually the ships uh, would make it back to England where they'd unload the cargoes and then the ships would be prepared and fitted out to head again down towards Africa. And so that's the main trading area that, that's going on at this time. And as a sailor on board a ship, that, uh, if you were confronted with pirates, Quite often, they would give you a choice, and the choice would be to join their crew. Uh, on occasion, at uh, quite a regular occasion in fact, uh, the pirates being short-handed might force you to join regardless of whether you wanted to or not. And for much of this period, up to two-thirds of a pirate ship's crew would actually be forced men. At, uh, when it came to the slaves, uh, pirates would quite often take slaves from ships, in particular s slaves that are working on board a ship. So these are trained sailors who are actually slaves on board a vessel. Uh, as far as pirates are concerned, generally speaking, these are free work, uh, free labour. So they'd take them. On some occasions, there were pirates who did liberate such uh, slaves and say, actually, we're going to treat you as a member of the crew, but this was not the common thing. There's a big mis misconception from many people that think this was a, a common state of affairs. It happened, but it was not a regular occurrence. As for taking slaves from a slave ship and putting them into your crew, terribly unlikely. Uh, they wouldn't have understood uh, the orders, they wouldn't have been able to actually do the job because they weren't trained. So it's unlikely this would have occurred, and I don't know of any cases where this did occur. Taking slaves from ships n when you're near ports where you could sell the slaves, that was a more common thing. Uh, so, and unfortunately... The general view of pirates is much the same as their contemporaries at this time. For example, we have uh, Bartholomew Roberts, also known as Black Bart. Uh, he's said to have set fire on at, uh, at least one occasion to a ship with slaves on board. Uh, to at least 80 slaves. Uh, and, not surprisingly, they all died because they were chained on board at the time. There was no particular reason to destroy that ship. So it was just an act of malice. He wasn't doing it to be cruel to the slaves. He was doing it as an act of malice to the owners of the ship. Uh, so it was report, this one was reported in the newspapers at the time. Uh, it's worth noting the newspaper reported the loss of cargo. There was no outcry about the loss of human life, which again reflects the attitudes of the time. They were worried, uh, con the con concern there was, oh, look at this destruction of property, not the destruction of slaves. So, at, uh, as a sailor, you are now in an ideal position to turn pirate. Now, many sailors would not wish to become pirates, which is why some were forced, but there are many reasons why a sailor may choose to become pirates. At, uh, and that really comes down to, again, uh, to the attitudes of the time. The captain of a ship was a supreme authority. They could choose to do 
almost anything they wanted to their crew as punishment, short of killing the crew. But, uh, and overly cruel captains uh, who treat, uh, mistreated their crews d did uh, cause piracy to occur. But, uh, there were some occasions where the captains themselves actually turned to pirates. Uh, so we'll talk about a few more examples of those in the part two, as well as what happens the day that the pirates turn up. But this is meant to be just a general introduction. I want to talk a little bit about clothing of pirates and sailors. Uh, as far as we get, uh, we're concerned, sailors and pirates should be dressing more or less the same. That's what the, most reports say. Uh, so they didn't change their dress just because they were pirates. The exceptions may, uh, may have been on occasion where a captain decided to dress more finely uh, than he would have previously. But, uh, but these, again, are not necessarily the general trend. If a ship did capture out uh, gentlemen's clothing, for example, this would normally be seen as property of the whole crew, not the captain specifically. Uh, so, so what do sailors wear? Well, they do actually have a distinctive fashion from other people. Uh, so, so the dress for a gentleman a man at the time is generally wearing breeches, uh, so, uh, so uh, that would be the, the style of dress with a shirt and then a jacket on top. Uh, to, and when we say jacket, jacket can be a, a, what we would call a waistcoat rather than a long sleeve jacket. And then, of course, a long sleeve jacket over the top. Uh, for sailors, uh, so, well, I'm currently wearing a pair of slop trousers, uh, so, uh, which is a fairly common uh, thing for sailors to wear. Uh, the other thing they might have worn... That uh, would have been the wider slop breeches. There's a pair in linen, uh, so, uh, for example. And these would be button up. Uh, generally, it would be cloth covered buttons for these. Uh, so, uh, and the top, you'd be looking at a shirt normally of linen. Cotton is mentioned, but we don't know what exactly they meant by cotton at that time. Uh, so, uh, so, simple shirt. Uh, as a white example, blue shirts are listed frequently in inventories on for sailors, and also striped, so like the one I'm wearing here. At, uh, on your feet, well firstly, at, uh, much of the time you're going to be wearing stockings. So these are wool stockings, at, uh, these will go just above the knee. At, uh, uh, they could be tied in place with garters as well. At, uh, and these will keep you warm even when they're wet because of course they're pure wool. But uh, you have on your feet a pair of shoes. Uh, bucket top boots are something you see a lot in films and Hollywood and so on, being worn by pirates, which is kind of strange because bucket top boots are riding boots. So boots at sea at, uh, are not really appropriate. They're not very at, uh, not going to offer you much more protection than a pair of shoes would for most things, and they're going to get worn out. They're, they're expensive things to be wearing. Whereas a pair of simple shoes like this at, uh, are pretty much bang on for the period. Small buckles, not the great big buckles that you see in the later parts of the 18th century. At this point, buckles shouldn't be more than about an inch and a half across at the most. These are quite good examples, about an inch and a quarter. At, uh, and that's your shoes. At, uh, and then, as a labourer, nearly all labourers would wear a neckerchief. It's quite good. We're just catching that the sweat there to mop your brow, uh, to, and lots of different patterns that uh, so were popular with sailors. So uh, to, uh, linen would normally be the case for a, uh, to, a neckerchief like that. Lastly, the headgear. Uh, to, uh, the tricorn hat is not an option. The tricorn hat doesn't exist. It's not. A, it doesn't come into fashion until the 1730s. So what did they wear? Well, we've got a nice example of a from hat here. So this is a wool frummed hat, even when wet that's going to keep you nice and warm so that's an ideal hat. Monmouth style hats are also very popular. But, uh, if you're in the tropics and you're not working on a busy day then a straw hat could well be the thing. Uh, this one has one side cocked up. Uh, cocked hats are fine and, di and were quite common. It's the tricorn hat which doesn't come about just yet. Again a wool brimmed hat. Yep. Perfectly plausible, and again, could be have a side cocked up, but again, on a windy day, you really want to be wearing your simple wool hats, like a front hat or a monmouth cap, going to make a lot more sense on board ship. Uh, 
For belts, belts should not be particularly thick. This is about maximum thickness really, about an inch and a half. Generally a double D type buckle. But, uh, uh, and just a very simple, um, it's not going to be tall and decorated, anything like that. Uh, a sailor is not likely to be wearing a cartridge pouch uh, to when, when working on board a ship. But if they're going ashore uh, to when they've been taking weapons, and a cartridge pouch would be uh, something that would be quite likely for them to have. Uh, so that's your, your, the, the basics of your clothing. Uh, so we're going to move on to talking about pirates in particular, weaponry, tactics, uh, and treasure on the next episode. Thank you.